Hello, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome back to Venture Wisdom. And this is the place, as you know, we always talk about venture capital, private equity, and everything around it. Uh, today, we are here to pick up a very interesting topic of India story, right? We have been seeing um, how uh, the India has evolved in the private markets, startup and private capital ecosystem. And who else can we have to talk about that story other than the person who's leading it from the front? Today, we have uh, Mr. S. Raman. He is the chairman and managing director of uh, Small Industries and Development Bank of India, SIGB, as we know it in the country, um, uh, and which also happens to be one of the largest, or in fact, the largest uh, limited partner in the funds investing in India and domicile in India for that matter. Uh, thank you so much, Mr. Raman, for taking time for this conversation today. Uh, I know that uh, India ecosystem from the venture and startup has, has been evolving fast, faster than what we have seen for the rest of the world. And uh, having you uh, for this conversation uh, is is a brilliant opportunity to understand where we have seen this ecosystem growing, where it stands now, and where it is going from here. So, um, for this discussion today, um, uh, would like to break it in two parts. Uh, obviously, one would like to understand uh, how the SIDB as an LP has been functioning in this ecosystem, and then your general views on the ecosystem as a whole. So we'll probably start with the first part of it, uh, uh, Mr. Raman, and that is SIDB as an LP, right? And uh, uh, we know that SIDB slash SIDB venture capital uh, has been in existence for almost 25 years now. SIDB has been older, but venture capital part has been about 20, 25 years now. But then when it started, venture capital space in India virtually did not exist, right? So I know probably it was somebody else who started at that point of time, but what what would have triggered a thought of having a venture capital, private capital, private uh, equity piece to be set up in India when the market was non-existent? SIDBI has actually been very proactive ever since its uh, origin. And it's about 34 years old now. We are talking about a, a multitude of instruments being brought out both in the debt and equity space. Of course, the debt space is uh, dominant. Therefore, it was no surprise that SIDBI brought up uh, or, you know, SIDBI and a few other government-backed funds came out in the late 90s as the first venture capital funds. Let me quickly move to the space of about, you know, the when the GFC uh, happened, even at the time of the GFC, we probably did not have much of a venture capital industry in India. And by which time SIDBI had already started giving out uh, equity portions, both directly through its own venture capital fund, as also from its balance sheet, it gave money to other venture capital funds, much like a fund of funds. And we actually trace back some brilliant investments in that area of 2003 to 2010, when on its own balance sheet, SIDBI gave money to a variety of other funds and even invested directly. So we are really talking about SIDBI being there in the venture capital space for a very long time and very active. Correct. Let me then quickly jump to 2015-16 mm -hmm. and by which time you've had a phenomenal growth in the public capital markets. We've got Indians who became wealthy and I think it's very important to recognize that fact that Indians both in India and Indians abroad had understood financial markets in a very, very detailed way. The Indian financial markets in India had matured tremendously. And we found India's economic story reaching that particular sort of trigger point or a takeoff point where it was an amazing leap of faith by the government once again in 2015-16 when they put together something called a fund of funds for startups. So government said we will put 10,000 crores into the market. And because of the maturity of the venture capital space by then, 
we found there were ready takers for that capital what we also found along the way and that i'm talking more 2019 20 was the return of a lot of indian fund managers to india because that i think is a function more of the india growth story becoming even more powerful mm -hmm. probably also leading to post covid things not working out that well in many developed countries so all in all what i'm trying to you know give give the listeners a visual is a country that is economically growing very strong and is looking at the venture space as a way to kick start the economy so we're no longer reliant only on debt we're talking about venture capital going into the hands of experienced fund managers many first time fund managers in fact amongst the 108 aifs that sidbi has supported in this 10000 crore fund of funds program about 40% are first time fund managers i must uh, qualified by saying that some of these first time fund managers are those who have run funds in maybe other jurisdictions but have come to india thereafter so no. they are experienced people and i think the important point here is that money was given in the hands of experienced people it's it's very evident uh, when you say the the uh, old and new managers equally performed well with whatever money you invested and i was i was reading uh, one of your statements recently uh, probably at the start of mahakum or the elsewhere that you made that that the the fund of fund had its initial returns in tune of about 3.54x right so it kind of substantiates very well that these managers have been performing and having 40% as the new or emerging managers uh, i'm pretty sure constitute a good part of that 3.5x 4x as well absolutely i i think you know uh, the initial returns are always i would say uh, only indicative and i don't think we should give it that much importance uh, initial returns are not very um, significant in magnitude also so let me say this about 1000 crores may have come back as sure. uh, you know distribution sure now that distribution is giving us an indication of a 3.2x return sure i will not go with that number going forward because you know things do change and correct we would probably be wise to wait for maybe another 12 months and then look at what's the you know uh, the the cumulative return that we have got the dpi that has really come so you know it's really the distribution page correct that's that's the nature of the uh, the the private capital itself right it's a high risk asset class by itself but what's what's a very interesting point that you made that okay there was an initiative that was taken the initiative was taken with a conviction and return whatever number it may be 1x 2x 3x 10x doesn't matter it is an indicator that it's 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 a risk worth taking and it it, it is performing so i think right. that's that's something which is worth acknowledging i would say absolutely so but then uh, 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 while you say that this is a perpetual fund it's that's perfectly fine but the funds that you invest in as an lp they are finite right so what kind of what kind of fund life you look at and what kind of funds you look at when you are making an investment in those funds uh, and what what position you hold uh, when you invest so the thesis of the fund of funds has been uh, you know more the venture space now having said that we've also appreciated the uh, returns of some of the early funds and that's when they come back with their fund 2 and fund 3 we've mm -hmm. also looked at them and they might have moved down to the sort of series b and series c also so sure. we are very happy to encourage the funds that has that have already given us some good returns we will never be able to give money to a fund 2 and a fund 3 without having seen their ability to return an early uh, amount of capital 
So and not necessarily like that see... fund has to have exited. They, it could be a midlife Absolutely. fund. Absolutely. Well. So we'd like to see some DPI. We'd like to see that, yes, you have. So, you know, we, we never want to force people to exit. We also appreciate okay. that startups will take a bit of time. There is a maturity. The secondary market is not something which is immediately available. And we'll talk about the sec secondaries later. But what we are saying is that if the fund life is typically a 7 plus 1 plus 1, and that's often the case, we are not asking you to you know, start exits in year 4. Now we're talking where we're sitting now is probably year 8 for some of the early funds. Sure. And therefore, when those early funds come in and ask for a fund 2 and fund 3, we have something on the table to see. And we have the TVPI, we have the other metrics that are available. But I think it's good to know that there have been some exits made because I think you know this better than I do. When you make an exit, then you realize how hard it is to run a fund. Of so, course. you know, the exits are not always easy. <laughs> of course. So with, with this half a billion, roughly about 4,500, 5,000 crores that has been uh, drawn down that you have invested uh, where has that gone what i mean by that is do you do you actually influence the thesis of the funds that they invest in either by geography or by sector or by a particular criteria say environment or diversity or anything yeah so you know the uh, 4500 crores has been drawn down we are very very keen that the funds draw down money a little faster but again i think uh, there has been a bit of a, you know, some kind of a, let me say, a slowdown in the absorption of funds. Now, this is something which I have not fully understood. So I can understand mm -hmm. a funding winter because money is not coming in from largely global sources and therefore AIFs find a funding winter. Now, our you know, contribution as an LP is small. Let me put it this way. Uh, based on this money of 10,000 crores that was committed, the 108 odd AIFs have raised 75,000 crores as a whole. So, you know, I think we're talking about some fairly staggering multiples and catalytic effects. So a 10,000 crores has led to a total corpus commitment of 75,000 crores. And Which you anchor all a, the funds or uh, you just you participate as well? Sometimes we have come even, uh, you know, sort of in, in, in close to the final close. But we are interested in coming more early on. So, you know, anchor is really a difficult concept because we enter into the space only after the PPM is registered with SEM. Correct. Correct. So, you know, we would like to be the early investors. But, you know, it, it sometimes happens that we are, uh, you know, also coming in a bit late. But more importantly, the funds where we have come in early has given a very big advantage to them to go around and get, collect more money. And that is something that we would like to continue to have that catalytic effect. So, and therefore, and we have recalibrated ourselves also to be able to come in early. Now, and generally, this, what, what is the position that you hold in the... I think for, for funds which are up to 300 crores, we can go up to 25%. And okay. for, you know, funds which are larger size, we would end up, you know, having a, you know, sort of a, a decreasing proportion. The max we would go to for a 1,000 crore fund or, a, you know, 125, uh, 150 million kind of a fund, we would end up probably at 17 to 18 sure. percent so you know it really depends on what we see as the potential of that fund so we would even go as low as 10 percent some in some cases so it, it it sort of varies but i think what's more important is we are uh, sector agnostic and therefore we would be very happy for a variety of areas to get funded so we have brilliant agri-tech funds we have a few climate tech funds and we'd be happy to have many more climate tech funds and science tech and deep tech funds. We certainly have some very good deep tech funds. But most of the funds that have come to us and the way that they have deployed the capital from the analysis of the portfolio companies, we find that a lot of them are just consumer tech. Sure. 
that thesis we certainly would like to change a bit and therefore going forward when we look at you know putting more funds into the startups we would probably appreciate that uh, if aifs come in with a slightly different uh, you know take we certainly would like to be more long term so right now we're saying that aifs have come in with whatever you know you know sort of fund period that they have decided but we are putting out the clear message saying we'd be happy with aifs coming in with a longer period so why are we not looking at you know 12 year funds why why not 15 year funds we yeah. have the patient capital for that sure so uh, i i hear that the patient capital government initiative uh, intends to boost the economy and the startup ecosystem as a whole but at the end of the day you are still an lp right so two 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 points as an investor which i'm curious about one what is it that that you necessarily do to evaluate the managers or the funds that you invest in and second what are the challenges as a lp that you face that's a great question rakesh i think you know <clears throat> i don't know how the experience of uh, lps is there across the world and we've got some huge lps in especially in the us and the canadian pension funds and people like that right. so you know i'm sure everyone's got their own uh, sort of tabulation and and their ability to do a score sheet and you know do the risk assessment so i think that bit would end up being fairly similar to what uh, you know other large lps would do so you definitely look at track records of fund managers and you end up understanding that if somebody has a particularly you know sort of um, skewed thesis then you are a little worried about are those industries something which are you know meaningful and are we looking at uh, putting money into those industries as i said if people do come forward more with deep tech and you know science tech funds those could be uh, looked at us separately and therefore we draw a lot of expert uh, you know people into our ic so we have domain experts across the iits the institute of science bangalore there are a lot of people who we could you know reach out to to be able to increase and improve the assessment levels so sure. that is something which is a continuous process sure the other aspect of your question is really how am i monitoring those gps and what is my relationship with those gps how passive or active am i as an lp and what is the way i am monitoring the funds which they have put in as an lp which is looking at you know growth of industries in india sure. we probably have a slightly larger uh, obligation to you know sort of talk to the gps and and get better information from them we are doing that we are also trying to you know um, do our own bit of you know analysis of that data which comes to us as an lp mm -hmm. this is something which we've taken up much more aggressively in the last 18 months or so i i i think we'll never get intrusive because we respect what the uh, gps are doing but we certainly will get a little more demanding and of late we have seen some of the gps coming back to us and saying you know we want to exit this particular company we may have you know 10 companies in our portfolio but this particular one we want to exit so kindly sign off it's it's at a 40% discount of the nav hmm. now this is really where we start getting into sort of uh, un uncharted territory and we need to sort of get a little deeper into this we need to discuss this at an industry level and mm -hmm. why i'm saying this particularly is one the valuation standards themselves are evolving as right. i said we've got great examples of companies being valued all over the place and then you know two years down the road we're talking one tenth of the value now this has happened of course this is you know stray cases a large number of companies are being valued 
fairly, you know, at stable uh, growth rates. But what's important is we start looking and talking to the industry and working more closely with them on the valuation standards. And that, I think, is a conversation that the IVCA has been having with SEBI, and we are also part of that. The second part of this is you want to exit something at 40% of the NAV, but kindly show me what is the due diligence and what is the level of search that you've done on the secondaries. And that's where I'm coming back to the secondaries. We are now at that phase where we need to look at the secondary market in a very different way. Yeah. So I think we've come it's, to that it's phase. That point six on my the, <laughs> uh, the list today. We'll probably pick it up in a little while, but I'll let you complete what you're saying. Yeah, please go ahead. Correct. So, you know, uh, the secondary market is something which we have all seen develop in different ways. I think there's some great secondary funds that are already there in India. Right. And I think they have a very good idea of the deals that are, you know, being done and they're in touch with the AIFs who are interested in exits. They are in a way playing a role like a market maker because, you know, they have the information, they're pushing the information on to other interested parties. So they are creating that network of people who are interested in the secondary space. Right. But there are too few players and I think the information is moving only to that limited network. Sure. I'm really looking at how we could, in a way, take a leaf out of the public markets because the secondaries is so well, you know, created. I mean, the public markets are all about secondaries. Of course. You know, so, you know, the entire area of uh, how stock exchanges function has been, you know, sort of uh, drilled down to a fine detail. Yeah. I'm not saying we do anything like that. This is unlisted space. We are talking about companies where information is not, you know, given out with so much of detail. We don't want a compliance burden on the GPs or on the portfolio companies. So we're not talking about anything there, but we're just saying you have the ability of creating a marketplace in a very simple manner where you call for quotations, you put out some basic information which is available to everybody, you call in a, you know, like a call auction. Now, call auctions have been done across the world in very innovative manner. And so there are some good platforms that exist which do that. I'm, I wouldn't be surprised. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah, that, I think that's a great point. And since we are still talking about secondaries, I will bring a few of the thoughts. And I, I hear uh, your point of having a better treatment of the secondary space because ultimately whatever the funds that you are invested in and further they are invested investing in uh, are creating the opportunities which will only lead to the secondaries. Right, uh, they have to exit uh, the other uh, co-investors with them. They have to exit. Somebody has to exit, and the only route to exit is secondaries. Not every not every company gets acquired 100% by a bought out, uh, and you don't get an exit. So uh, now, and I'll keep it very quick on this particular point. Don't want to go too long into it. But then, uh, the the world has been looking at a lot of advancements in the secondary space. Right, particularly even with the uh, with the newer technologies like tokenization and fractionization of the assets right. like equities. Right. Right? right. Do you see us as 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 a jurisdiction heading towards that direction anyway? So my answer would be a very big yes. I mean, I think you know, uh, as as a nation, as a you know um, set of uh, individuals, we we have. Uh, sort of taken to digitization of all types very, very easily. And I think we are we are not scared to move into that space. So, you know, whether it comes out as a tokenized uh, method on a blockchain, I think these are fairly easy experiments that we could conduct. You know, yeah. how long does it take for us to conduct a POC for, you know, a few funds that are willing to join hands and put this out in some sort of a, you know, blockchain methodology where, Information is, you know, available freely to those people who want to come into it. And we have clear call auction methodologies which are running on that. It's but right now I'm hearing, 
I'm, I'm hearing a practitioner speak about it. You have been a regulator in past as well, right? And just wearing that regulator's hat for a moment, do you think our regulators are ready to adopt or look at that direction? Our regulators have always done things which are which have a deep economic logic. I mean, that is really the only answer I will give because if, even if you look at the public listed space, I remember having conducted call auctions for illiquid securities and we had a very detailed mechanism on how it should be done. So we yeah. had something open for 45 minutes. We had a 15 minute window for people to reconcile their orders. We ran something which was very, very sophisticated. It's just a different matter that there were such illiquid securities that we hardly had a response. But, sure. but that's the nature of illiquid security. So all I'm saying is that the economic logic is illiquid securities. It doesn't matter whether you, can, you call them as listed or unlisted. You know, so an unlisted, uh, or sorry, a listed illiquid security behaves the same as an unlisted illiquid security. So, you know, I think this, the logic is very clear that we want participation because if value exists on the table, we'd like more people to be able to partake of that value and add to that value. Interesting point of view. And I really hope we get into that direction because the world is moving in that direction. And uh, uh, for every good reason, India has been leading from the front. Uh, so I hope we see something on that. But coming back to you, the, or should be as a as an LP, and now uh, I'm just thinking of the the listeners who are either the first time managers, or I would say largely the first time managers. If they are looking at you as a as an LP, what advice do you have to them when they approach should be for an investment? That's again a, a a great question, and I'd really like to you know answer it with the experience that we've had in dealing with first-time fund managers. And I think we have uh, mentored them. I mean, I, I'll put it very bluntly. We've had some first-time managers which have been with our team for over two years mm -hmm. because they really would like to get into the funds business. It's extremely difficult. It's a fairly, uh, you know, sort of hard pitch that you have to make in front of anybody even for a matter of getting too close from them let me you know it, it's i think it the more we uh, you know demystify this the better it is for everybody so okay. making a pitch for two crores in an hni or a family office you really have to go through a lot and therefore a first time fund manager sometimes comes to us and says listen i've managed to raise 25 crores I thought I would do a hundred. Now, hmm. what advice do we give him? So, you know, he's waste. He's not, let me say wasted. He's gained valuable experience, but it's taken over a year for him to, you know, sort of raise maybe 25 to 50 crores. Now, how does he go about it? I mean, these people have fire in the belly. They've got the passion. They are coming from sometimes even the smaller cities, but they see huge value in certain enterprises which they know very well so you know we are looking at uh, no two situations that are the same we're therefore holding their hand and telling them listen this is how you go about it we sometimes get them to talk to better known fund managers who are experienced mm -hmm. so you know because of the network that is available in front of us and the fact that we talk to fund managers of all hues we are therefore able to help a lot of first-time fund managers, a lot of women managers also. Sure. So what, what would be the top three points that you would say that if they come with, makes their chances of both getting the money and getting it faster? So one, I think you need to know your market. You need to have some understanding of what you want to do with your money. You know, you cannot be asking us, listen, should I put it in A or B? Now, that is really your initial due diligence and your understanding of your hyper-local market. So mm -hmm. it is very important for you as a fund manager to have that clarity that, yes, I know where this money can go to and I've already done my homework. Then it's really easy for us to you know, help them gain a little confidence saying that, yes, we know that these are the kind of investors you know, that are available in India. 
we'll certainly help you and we can you know even put you in touch with other fund managers who might help you sure sure so uh, uh, just jumping from there to the the growing startup ecosystem in the country and relating it with the the growing number of vcs as well for that matter now i'm just trying to do a small comparison of the ecosystem here versus certain geographies overseas uh the the relative exit values are lower in the country do you see that is anywhere a deterrent to the venture capital uh, as an industry in india but you know the irrs over here are not not all that low so you know i don't think it's uh, fair to be able to compare them with other jurisdictions because even in india you've got a range of irrs which are you know going all over the place from 6% to you know to 100% so mm. you know i i think the value of an exit is really you know uh, uh, highly correlated in the function of the amount of effort that you have put in and the ability for you to be able to help that founder create a better market and a wider market by and large in india with the kind of growth that we're seeing in the economy i would be very surprised if uh, you know generally speaking the value of exits is uh, you know significantly lower than other jurisdictions um from here on, on a general outlook where do you see the indian uh, private capital and the startup ecosystem going oh i think it's going to you know i i'm looking at a number of 100 times from what we've got today because the amount of money that is waiting on the sidelines to come into uh, what we would really call as the deep tech area and the science tech area so right. the incubation centers is something that sibbi has focused a lot in the last 12 months mm-hmm. we've put in some bits of money across 15 to 16 incubation centers you'll be amazed as to the number of good projects that are emerging from the student community correct right. so you know we have seen uh, one of our funds is called campus fund it's done some amazing work to be able to sift through hundreds of proposals not all of them just idea stage some of them are actually you know sort of worked uh, worked it out and they've got uh, you know uh, some pocs going on the ground and the the selection of their portfolio companies has led to some brilliant results so i'm very confident that we're talking uh, given the aptitude of this country in what is known as the stem area i would say that we're talking a lot of technology a lot of science based uh, founders coming up and therefore the amount of money that's going to chase those uh, founders is going to be large we yeah. ourselves as as a government of india a 1 lakh crore fund has been announced this fund also is going to largely be dedicated to areas of green tech clean tech and and deep tech believe me it's going to have a huge catalytic effect for funds coming in from abroad because if we get the secondaries right then you're talking about great values that are going to come to the you know first time fund managers the guys who are right now running their funds and they'll be able to then put a lot of money back into the economy So I see a virtuous cycle already, you know, sort of building up. With that, I think I, I did mention, the, make a quick mention about the gift city part. And towards the end, mm-hmm. I have one uh, one question with two parts to it, right? One with gift city coming up as a evolving jurisdiction, it's still different as an IFSC. Uh, does Sydney continue to be a part of the funds which are established in gift city as well? that's part one of so you know question. at the moment our uh, mandate under the fund of funds is really domestic uh, capital going i mean uh, our capital going into the domestic uh, area sure now where gift city is going to really make a difference is to be able to attract global funds and therefore we've already seen i think something like 40 plus fund managers uh, getting licenses in gift city correct i don't know how many of them have already set up funds i don't have that number with me but i'm sure there's going to be a lot of excitement because what gift city is really doing is that it's pitching itself against the uh, other jurisdictions 
of you know the dubai the erstwhile mauritius the singapore so you know you're talking about some good constructive competition coming about in this area now sure. if gift city can actually create that viable competition for foreign capital global capital to come and sit at the mm-hmm. gift city and of course from there you can invest anywhere in the world i mean you can go into the entire asia and africa and middle east but i'm just saying that there is a greater chance of money flowing from gift city into the domestic area so you already kind of answered my second part of it uh, that your thesis as it be is domestic it's india but i'll still kind of restructure my uh, second part because it still sits as a curiosity with me uh, many of the other uh, sovereign funds uh, sovereign lp sovereign wealth funds uh, in east in middle east in in west they do invest in the funds overseas why not uh, said be no it's a great point so you know i think we need to understand very clearly what's the uh, you know source of funds for these sovereign funds what we're really looking at is the sidbi fund of funds is an attempt and proven to be reasonably successful as we speak today to kick start enterprises in india sure so you know i'm saying it is not strictly speaking the way a sovereign fund of uh, you know abu dhabi or a norway has got constituted so sure. they are really looking at sort of their budgetary surpluses a lot of it rides on the oil surpluses but it could be others also but it is their government surpluses that are getting invested in other jurisdictions whereas in india we are really not talking about these funds coming from some budget surplus this is just part of our you know capital expenditure so if i were to sure. really look at it from a government budgeting point of view this is capital expenditure of the government going into india sure the beauty is that it's capital expenditure through private hand so i would say it's a rather you know a phenomenal example of a public private partnership where government Agreed. funds are coming into the hands of private fund managers which are run entirely independently without any interference so i think that it's 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 what i hear is it's more thesis driven there it's probably just parking your surplus money and making whatever multiples you can do out of it here it is the agenda is more towards the the domestic economic development and parking money for that development rather than multiplying it absolutely and and you're creating wealth in your own country yeah Oh, uh, great thoughts. I, uh, I think this brings us to the end of our conversation. Uh, I, I thoroughly enjoyed speaking with you today. Some pertinent points made. Uh, good advice for the listeners uh, when they have to approach uh, SIDBI as an LP versus generally being a good GP by themselves as well and how we see India uh, story growing further. completely enjoyed this conversation i i so thank you for taking time uh, to talk with me today no thanks a lot rakesh and you know we should certainly uh, you know sort of uh, come back on a couple of points so that your information and and you know sort of statistics from different parts of the world will inform us better as we move along in this journey but thank you so much for having me here today